Okay, so it looks like I'm a couple seconds behind. That's cool. That's cool. We'll figure it out. So this time I want to make sure that you guys can hear me and I'll delete the other one. Craziest things happened, right? All right, let's see if I can get this together. All right, I'm going to check what you guys to see if I'm live this time and if you can hear me. So if, you, if you're if you in the box, if you uh, guys are watching, let me know if you can hear me. You can hear me? Awesome. Good to go. Good to go. Okay. So now I can see you guys and you can hear me. I'm in a good place. Okay. So here's what I was talking about that was so important. Let me move the screen over really quickly. Okay. Well, I don't know how important it was, but here's what I was talking about that I thought uh, was semi-important. That's a better way of putting it. All right. So <clears throat> in the groups... Uh, for illustrators or whatever, a couple people had uh, a question. And they were asking about, so my friend Joe, Joe P, let's call him Joe P, he was asking about how do you compete with uh, people overseas who are charging next to nothing for their artwork, okay? And um, that's a really good question, right? Um, and I wanted to give what I thought would be a good answer, how I look at it. You can't really compete with people who are charging $10, $20, $30 an illustration. It's impossible. for If you live in America and you want to do this for a living, maybe if you're young, 18, 19, 20, 21, you're just starting out, um, I would say it's even low then, depending on what your skill level is. But you can't really compete with that rate in America if you live in you know, any, any civilized, not a civilized country, but any industrial country. It's almost impossible to... Um, do that. So Joe and his friends were all having this conversation and they were talking about, you know, how do we survive in a market where people are coming and undercutting us for such a low rate? And I read the comments and I followed and I paid attention and I thought there were some really insightful things being said. Um, but, you know, the most important thing for me was understanding competition. And, and, and how you could survive um, in this market. You like my beard, Alex? I've been working on it. It's coming back. I'm going to grow it all the way back. <laughs> this time, I'm not going to cut it off. I had to cut it off for my daughter's wedding. But uh, I don't plan on cutting it off anymore. Plus, I, you know, my daughter and my son-in-law had a baby. So I'm a grandpa now. That's crazy, man. They're making me an old man. But it's all good. All right. So <laughs> back to the task at hand. Okay. So... When people are charging next to nothing, how do you survive in that market? You know, what is it that you can do? What can you do to compete with them? Um, the reality is, <clears throat> is that one, you have to set your value as an artist and you have to hold true to it. You have to say, how long does it take me to do this? What is the profit that I feel I deserve from it? You know, what's a reasonable expectation as an artist? You know, of course, you don't want to charge yourself out of the game. You don't want to go... Oh, for illustration, is ten thousand dollars for one single page. Well, you may feel that you're worth that, but if there's no one, if there's no market to pay it, you're not worth it. Or you may be worth it, but if there's no market to give you the money, it, it, it's irrelevant, right? So you want to create um, an environment where you can actually thrive and make a living. And in doing so, it means that you have to market yourself accordingly, price-wise. You can't just go and say, oh, "I'm going to charge," you know, charge people whatever I want to charge them. So that's the first thing. But once you have a price, once you realize, okay, it takes me a week to do an illustration or two days, three days, whatever, and I work about nine, eight hours a day, and I want to do a rate of $30, $20 an hour, whatever yours is. I'm just throwing numbers out. I'm not giving you guys my rates. Um, <clears throat> you know, you want to be conscious of that and say, all right, here's what my time is worth in this case, and here's what I'm willing to do. And then you go from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So... But then how do you compete in a market where people are constantly undercutting you and, and coming back and um, saying, I'll do I'll do an entire book for $150. That actually happens, right? So if you've illustrated, you know, like that's insane. Uh, who, who does that? Who would do 24 drawings or paintings for $150? Well, there are people who will. So once again, how do you compete? And I'll get to the, the end of the conversation. I'll, I'll give the answer now. Your work has to be of such substance that the client says, whatever you're charging, I'm willing to pay within reason. Meaning, someone else may come and say, I'll do it for $30, but what's the quality like? Right? I like to attract my clients based on um, the work that I'm doing. 
I like to attract my clients based on my style. Uh, I like to attract clients based on the success that the, the, the work that I've currently done or recently done is pulling in or, or you know, the success speaks for itself. <clears throat> One of the things I'll tell my clients are or is check it out. Check this book out. It's doing really well. My, I'll, I'll say my authors do really well and they make this amount of money on average in the first two weeks. As opposed to someone who says, I'll do the book for a quarter of what he charges. Yeah, but if the book doesn't sell because the artwork isn't quote unquote pretty, <clears throat> what good is it, right? It's no good unless you're creating a project where you just want to say, look, mom, I produced a book or I did some type of graphic novel or whatever. Uh, so I like to argue the point of choosing me in the long run works well for you. You'll make the money I charge you back and more. You know, that's that's my argument, right? So I let my style, I let my artwork speak for why I should be hired. And I stand by that. I don't, you know, I may fluctuate a little bit, but not very much. I usually am pretty borderline hardcore when it comes to uh, my pricing. And I don't need to get every client, guys. And I want you guys to think about this. You don't need every single client that comes to you. Uh, in reality, you know, once you get to a place, you should have too many clients where a couple things happen, where you're turning clients away constantly or you raise your price so they remove themselves. That's really important. You know, if everybody can afford you, either you're not very good or you're a really bad business person. If everybody can afford your work, you're not very good. Think about this. So take your favorite artist or your favorite illustrator and go... Okay, see if you can find what they charge. You know, it's possible, maybe, maybe not. But for me, I like Kadir Nelson. I think he is um, a genius when it comes to art. <clears throat> um, my friend Will, I will tell you, I think Will, Will, Will and I became friends because I like his work. <clears throat> uh, and we just became friends based on that. A friend of mine said, hey, man, you should check Will Terry out. You get into books. He's really into books. Introduced us. Uh, and that friend was from video games. But Will's work stood out so well to him that he said, you know, why don't you meet him? I met Will. Will's been great, been a good friend, teaching me a lot about books. And so over the last three and a half, four years, I've been able to get into the market. <clears throat> but I go, well, how much do you think they charge? Well, I ask them, how much do you charge per? And they tell me, <clears throat> none of them will ever tell you they're charging $30 per, $50 per, $75 per. Why? Because they believe their work is worth more. <clears throat> um, when you have a gift or skill or talent, you always don't be afraid to charge for that skill, gifted talent. Uh, don't feel bad about it. And you have to hold true to it. You know, dropping your prices to compete may not always be the best thing. <clears throat> you don't have to get every client. I want to share with you guys a story. This is my second time telling this story today. I told it earlier, but there was no audio. So I'll tell it again. All right. <clears throat> There's a daddy bull and a baby bull. And they're on top of a hill. Some of you may have heard this story before. That's okay. I'm going to tell you again. So <clears throat> the baby bull looks up. He goes, Daddy. And Daddy goes, Yes, son. He says, Why don't we run down the hill and get that cow? Father bull looks deeply into his son's eye. And he says, Son, why don't we walk down the hill? And all of the cows. And so... <laughs> That metaphor leads to <clears throat> being patient and understanding what you're doing. Don't be in a hurry to get one thing when you can have a lot of things. And then sometimes you only need one thing instead of a lot of things. So the reverse of that is if I get seven IMs or emails a day asking about work and a possible project and I have to turn them all down because they can't afford me or they realize I'm too expensive for them, all right, that's fine. Maybe one client a week will say, hey, I'm willing to move forward with you. <clears throat> so seven times five. All right. So let's say let's say 30 people come and out of the 30, you get about four or five people who are willing to negotiate, are willing to sign a contract and work with you. I don't need all 30 people. I can't even handle 30 people. So I'm growing my studio now. I can't handle 30 people, so I don't need 30 people. But I need four people who believe in my work enough to pay me what I'm asking. 
those four people will take me much further than the 30 people. The 30 people will slow me down. They'll complain. It's too much work. They want more work for nothing. They want the highest quality work that I'm capable of producing for the lowest amount of money. Those are not the clients that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the clients who are hungry. I'm looking for the clients who know or believe they know my worth and are willing to pay. Right? <clears throat> those are the people I want to partner with. Let me tell you why. I'll go a little deeper and tell you why I want to partner with those people. Those people tend to step back and say, look, I'm paying you this amount of money. I must trust you. I like your style. I like your art. I trust you. They're going to let you do your artwork. The people who don't want to pay you oftentimes want to be the author and they want to be the artist. They want to be the lead artist. They want to be the director. They want to tell you everything about every scene. They know more than you. Now, you may have four, five, six, eight years of experience. They have zero, but now they're the expert. And oh, by the way, you should do whatever they tell you to do because they're paying you peanuts. You don't want that. At least you want to walk away with your dignity and say, hey, you know what? I disagree with this art decision, but they're paying me enough that I can swallow my pride. <laughs> that's the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario, that's what happens, right? You got completely disagree with this art decision, but they did pay the full price. I could live with that, right? So, you know, when you sign on, when you decide to work with a client, you want to think about these things. You know, if somebody thinks they can get you for cheap, then they don't value your work. Now, you can, of course, take a project on and say, oh, man, I'm just taking a project on. I think it's a great project. It's a beginning for me. You could do that. But I would say don't make it a habit of doing that. Like, try to get away from that. You know, put value in your work. Maybe your first project, you could do that. But after that, you shouldn't be doing that anymore. You should be able to say, look at the quality of work I produce. Hire me for this amount of money. That's your job. That's your responsibility as an artist is to say, look at the quality of work I produce and this is my price. And if they really respect your work, if they like your style, if they like what you do, more often than not, they're going to say, okay, I'll pay it. Not, no, I don't want to say more often than not. The clients you want more often than not will say, I'll pay it. Um, and then don't be afraid to hold true. Sometimes you have to turn work away, but then there'll be times where you're desperate and you need to make a quick buck and you got to take that money. But that should be few and far in between. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm almost at my 15-minute mark of a live, so I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, nobody, We don't have a lot of questions. Good. You guys are just listening. Wonderful. Okay. So keep that in mind going forward. Hold true to your price. Stop worrying about people who charge less. Focus more on your art. Make, make your art style, your style of artwork, so beautiful, so consistent, so professional that people, their response to you is, man, I got to hire this dude. Or I got to hire this girl. They have dope work and I want them to do my book or I want them to do my poster. I want them to do my tattoo, whatever it is. And then you hold true to it. You know, don't necessarily let the market determine your worth or your price. You can find out what the market is charging, but then say relative to what you think you're worth, that's what you charge. Now, once again, if you're going to charge $10,000 a page, you're probably not going to get a lot of work. That's the reality. You do have to understand the market. But, you know, when people are talking about $50 a page, that's blasphemy. That's peasantry. And if you're an artist and you have skill and you're decent, that should offend you. And, you know, to some people, that's an elitist attitude. But I feel like if you're going to spend 8, 9, 12, 14 hours for $50, you might as well get a job in a factory or wherever. And not, nothing against factory workers. But at least it's consistent work. At least it's a constant check. At least it's with health care. So get a full bang for your buck. But if you want to be an artist, man, don't be afraid to charge people what you want to charge people. Don't be afraid to charge people what it's worth. So ultimately, here's the answer to the question. Do dope work. Charge what you want. If you're doing crappy work, then yeah, you got to take what you can get. But if you're studying and becoming a better artist, learning new techniques, learning how to paint better taking additional classes, working with other artists, you know, getting good feedback, then, you know, you can easily state your price and stick to it. So that's my spill about this, you know, learning how to price your work, how to compete in your pricing, how to competitively price your work is more like it. Um, this should work for you. You don't need every client. You just need the right client, the right client who's willing to partner with you. So, 
That's it, you guys. Um, uh, let's see. 14.47. I'm doing good. All right. So this will be exactly 15 minutes. I appreciate you guys checking in. I see you guys in the chat. I'll stick around. And if I missed any questions, I'll come back. Um, I'm going to post more this year. So here's what we got coming to 2018. I am going to do my Kickstarter. I'm saying it out loud so you guys can talk trash to me on Facebook and Instagram that I didn't do my Kickstarter. Um, I am, what else am I going to do this year? Oh, I am going to do more content for my channel. Like right now, I'm doing a live right now on a Friday. And I think it's going to be every Thursday, every Friday. Um, let's see. Alex says, very good point. Find a niche and run with it. People will want your work. Capitalize on your style. Never stop learning. Never become complacent. Same thing for bodybuilding in a way. Man, that's brilliant. That's absolutely right. I, I'm, I want to shut up, but yeah, it's true. You know, <clears throat> I like the UFC. I'm a big fight fan. <clears throat> and the best fighters have their own style. And guess what? They attract fans who like that style. So I'm a John Jones fan. I think John Jones is the greatest fighter who's ever graced MMA. Gets in trouble all the time. I get in trouble all the time. So we have that in common. But his style is his style. And all right, I got a little more to say about this. I got a little more to say about this. I will always be a poor man's Kadir Nelson. Always. So why try to be Kadir Nelson? Instead of being the best Tyrus I could be. Right? So when you see work by Tigo Sketch, Tyrus, it's Tyrus's work. And it's going to be the best work that Tyrus could produce at that time. I will always be a second-rate Kadir Nelson, so why try to imitate him directly? <clears throat> um, you know, find who you are as an artist. So Art Greek is saying, how can you find your niche? It's really, what is it you want to do? Right? If you like drawing robots, draw robots. Like, you know, hey, man. Become a really good artist at drawing robots. You can progress. You can grow and do other things. Like for me, I started off drawing ninjas and monsters. And I regressed to, in style, I guess you could say regressed, to children's artwork. But you know what? It fit what it is I want to do. I like the way I can draw, sculpt, paint. So it works out. And I just happen to find a niche, niche that I fit in. And I, I'm going to stick to it until I get bored and do something else. Every five, six years, I get bored and I do something else. So, um... Yeah, man, that's really the key. You know, be the fighter you want to be and let people enjoy you for it. You can't win everybody. Every client's not going to hire you. That's just not the way the world works. Every client's not going to hire you. So you have to look for the people who like what you do. Uh, can you get better? Yeah, you can attract different clients. But in the meanwhile, in the meantime, you have to focus on who you have, who wants you, uh, who's interested in you, uh, who wants to support you, and that's what you go for. And I have, you know, I'll probably do another conversation on that. I was in game and I couldn't really find my my thing, man. I couldn't really find that standout thing that I was looking for. When I came over to books, illustration, man, it was natural. It hit right away. And my, my friend Julie, she was my boss when I was a concept artist at the first job I got out of school. Shout out to Julie. She's a great designer, too. She says, she sent me to I am. I'll never forget that. She goes, this is your thing. And I go, what? Children's books? Like, what? Are you serious? I was insulted. I'm going to be real with you guys. I was like, "This? are you kidding me? You know, going from these complex creatures and, mon and, and monsters and ninjas and all of this to these simplified shapes and little kids and whatever. I was like, what is she talking about, right? But then I dug a little deeper, checked out. A little bit more and said, man, you know, I could do this. I actually like this. I could take a derivative of what I'm doing now and create it here. And that's what I did. That's why I still work in 3D and 2D. Um, and it makes me happy. Um, it makes me happy. So I'm going to answer your question because I'm live. Art Greek Design, you wrote, how can we develop diversity in our niche, niche without getting stuck in stereotypes? Well, that's good. That's a good question. So what I'd like to do is this. I try to spend some time mastering a certain thing or becoming comfortable enough that I go, I could do that, right? So when I worked, when I was in toy design, uh, I, I worked with some really good artists who had been doing it for 15, 20 years before I even got there. And I'm not kidding. I mean, these guys, could, they could do some really good stuff. And so what I would do is say, okay, I'm going to pick up on your style and do it. So I do it for six months, four years, five months, or whatever, not four years, four months, five months. And I would study what they did and imitate it. Then I gravitate to another artist. So my boy Mark was the first one, then the other Mark, he was the second one, and I would just see how they did things and 
oh, okay, that's a really cool way of doing it. And so what I was doing was in the process of learning, I was compiling my knowledge, my art knowledge, and then implementing it into my own thing. And the more you draw, the more you do, whatever you do, draw, sculpt, your style will show up because it's you, right? Only you can produce the artwork you do. Everybody else is copying or you're copying somebody else. But what will happen is the more you do what you do, you'll have your own style and it becomes recognizable. That's why your favorite artist, when you see their work, so Salvador Dali, right? I don't think he goes, man, I want to be an artist that everybody will remember and hang my pictures up on the wall. No, man, he dug deep and said, I like to melt stuff in my head. I'm on acid or whatever he was doing, smoking Arizona weed. I don't know, you know, he's in the desert doing this, whatever. He painted what was in his head and who he was. And that translated to beautiful art. And it's his art, it's his style. Same thing with Pablo. If you look at his work, it's the same thing. Any artist of great reputation, when you see their work, you know it's their work. Why? Because they repetitively did what they did until they developed their own style naturally and then everything they did looked like that. Uh, and so that's the answer to the question. You have to do the same thing. You just keep working, keep working, keep working and your artwork will look like your artwork. So if you've ever been to my Instagram or my Facebook page, uh, you look at my work, you go, okay, so if you saw someone else pull my work down, you'd be like, man, that looks like Tyrus's work. Oh, it is. It's still Tyrus's work. And then you know, right? So everybody develops their own style in due time. It's not something you have to force. It's not even something you consciously do. It would just develop. So periodically, I'll go to my Instagram. I'll scroll through my Instagram and say, am I consistent in what I'm doing? Or am I chasing a ghost? Because you can never catch another person's style, right? And if I see that I'm chasing a ghost, I make it a point not to. I can learn from other people, but I don't want to imitate other people. I don't I, I don't want to steal and become them. I, I want to learn from them. So let me see. One of my favorite 3D artists, good friends, Point Pusher, uh, Dan. Uh, if you haven't seen his work, find him on Instagram, Point Pusher, P-O-I-N-T-P-U-S-H-E-R, Point Pusher. He is a great 3D artist. Now, he takes a cartoony approach to 3D. Now, I don't have to be him. I can learn from him, though. I can chill and go, man, this dude, he's got something good going here. How is he doing that? So I talk to him, and I, hey, how do you do X, Y, and Z? He tells me, oh, okay, man, that's good. That's good. And then I take what he gave me, and I implement it into my style and into my work. So that's it. All right, that's the answer to that question. That's how you find your own. Uh, Alex is asking me another one. What to do if someone steals your work, and you don't have much of a social media present? Well... That's a different conversation for maybe a different day. If you hit me up on Facebook or Instagram, Alex, my Instagram chat thing is garbage. Hit me on Facebook, and um, if you ask me and we have a conversation, then I'll bring it. Maybe that's what we talk about next week on Friday. So I appreciate you guys jumping in, joining me. I know I got more questions. I'll scroll back through and try to answer them um, in the group in a little bit. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, hopefully I helped someone. So price your arcs. Your art, stick by your pricing, do great artwork, and you'll find clients, all right? So have a good one.